I'm Will Terrell. Welcome to this video. <laughs> um, so, this is another people sketching video. Um, and I'm going to be sketching this adorable little old man I saw at the grocery store a few weeks back. Uh, and he, I don't know, he just looks so melancholy, which was appropriate because all he had in his basket was two little melons. That's it. He came in, ate his breakfast, bought his melons, and then went home. It was it was pretty cute. Um, see, so yeah, I can't wait to sketch him. I like how round his mill part was. Uh, yeah. So, um, first, before I start sketching, I wanted to just say thank you so much to Sykra for doing the video interview with him uh, last a couple weeks ago. Um, I've gotten a ton of subscribers from his channel, and I think it's t a testament to how awesome he is as a person that his uh, viewers that have come over to my channel are just like the ni nicest and sweetest people. Uh, and that says a lot about him as a creator, that that's the kind of community he's cultivated. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for you guys showing up on my channel, and I hope you enjoy the videos from here out. Uh, and also I wanted to thank my subscribers that have been watching this whole time because we just passed like 9,000 subscribers. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, Sykra. I appreciate you, man. And I really enjoyed the talk. I learned, I got a lot out of it, um, both before and during the interview and after the interview. But anyways, so I'm going to sketch this guy here uh, and... These are my markers. These are old markers. They're like, I've said it before. It's like 10, 10 years old or something like that. So uh, I'm just gonna lay in some tones to get started with. Let's see here. Um, so on top of doing this sketch, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna talk about something. Um, my last people sketching video that I did, posted a couple weeks ago or actually it was probably about a month now. Um, I said something that I shouldn't have said in the video and one of my viewers uh, called me out on it and I just wanted to thank you in person. Uh, the, uh, it wasn't, I mean, it's not a big deal to most people, but it is to me. Uh, and what it is is I, Towards the end of the video, I mentioned uh, Christopher Hart and that I, I don't recommend his books to people, to artists, especially when they're starting out. Uh, and I, you know, part of it was I was tired. I, I'd just gotten off of weeks and weeks of deadlines nonstop and not sleeping much. But that's not really an excuse. Because um, it's not the kind of person I want to be. You know, uh, I'm not the type of person, I don't want to be the type of person that criticizes other artists or other people in general because uh, it's it's not useful uh, it, what I should have done is recommended books that I do like you know instead of just picking one guy out and saying I don't like what he does um, or, or how he does it and uh, my frustration isn't really with him it's that I see the potential in what he does and I think he could be doing more uh, but that's my issue. It's not him. <laughs> but I wanted to bring it up in this video and, and talk about that as an issue. Uh, partly because it's something that has plagued my career and plagued my life is being critical of others and judgmental of others. And it's something I'm really working on. I don't want to be that, that kind of person. Uh, but I thought I'd talk about why it matters in this video and also how it relates to your art. Um, so why does it matter? I, I think for most people, it's not a big deal. And in fact, I got more comments, you know, about how they agreed with it than anything. But that doesn't that doesn't make it okay. Um, especially as a teacher, because uh, I consider myself a teacher more than anything, even more than as an artist. And uh, as a teacher, it's not okay for me to criticize other people. And uh, if you ever catch me doing that, please say something. Because I want to be a better person. I want to be a better man. Uh, and this is one of my biggest issues. I think the real key is that when you judge others, 
you're saying more about yourself than you are about the person you're criticizing. So for me, there's a lot of things that Chris Hart is really good at. He's much better at business than I am. He's much better, much more prolific than I am. I mean, the guy's put out tons of books in his career, and that's admirable. Admirable, and he's been very successful with it. And there's so much stuff behind the scenes that I don't know about that he that got him to where he's at. You know, he had to have been really good at networking and making connections with editors or or publishers or or whatever. It, I mean, that's that's a an achievement, and it's something to be admired, not somebody something to be criticized. Essentially, we only hate in others what we hate in ourselves. That's why we hate it so passionately, because we wish we were better, especially at the things that we're weakest at. And when somebody is either uh, really successful at it, and it's something we struggle at, we have a tendency either to really admire that about them, or to criticize that they should be doing it better. At least in my experience. And the other part to that is, and this is where it relates to being an artist, when you criticize yourself, it keeps you from enjoying the art that you're doing, which is bad, and it holds you back. But even worse, when you criticize others, you're spending time, uh, you're avoiding the time that it takes to get better at your own work. And sometimes it, be it becomes an obsession. You spend so much time worrying about what other people are doing or not doing that it's a detriment to your own career. And that has been the number one source of um, failure in my life, more than anything. Uh, um, because I, I, I have spent a lot of time in my career thinking other people, you know, criticizing other people in trying to get them to do more and to be more and to you know live up to a higher level of expectations without actually pushing myself to do that and it's only been the last uh, I'd say maybe two or three years that I've really gotten good at pushing myself and not worrying about what other people are doing because um, it's easy it can be addicting to worry about other people <laughs> instead of yourself it's easier to point at other people's flaws than do something about your own. The thing is, it, it usually, when you have an issue like this, like myself, and it's uh, sincerely, it is something I've been working on. Um, when you have an issue like this, it usually never starts off with malice or, you know, with the intent to hurt somebody or to, you know, to be a jerk or whatever it is. It usually starts off from a very loving place, like you sincerely want to help people. So yeah, for, for me, I really became aware of the issue because I, I didn't know it was something I was even doing for the longest time. Uh, and one of my, um, probably, I think it was the second studio I had. This was probably in like 2003 or something like that. Uh, and I had a group of maybe seven or eight artists that I was working with. And... Um, I've mentioned this before, but I've never told the story behind it on this channel. Uh, but, um, yeah, I it started off as just, you know, the opportunity for a bunch of guys to get together and publish comics together. But it turned into, um, like, a big clash of egos. A lot of people fighting with each other. And in my issue, uh, I was going around thinking people should be doing more, contributing more, striving to be more. And I still feel that way. I think everybody should strive to be their best. But uh, through the process of this studio, I realized that it has nothing to do with me. I can still want people to do better, but I can't do it for them. It has to come from within or else it doesn't matter at all. And uh, in this studio, I ended up... Um, just all these people that I cared about for years, over criticizing them for you know months and months, and pushing some of them away, and attracting jerks in the other direction, <laughs> you know, and that that's what happens is when you you get what you put out into the world. If you put out in the world 
uh, that you're kind of a jerk. You're going to attract jerks. Or you're going to attract opportunities to be a jerk. Until you learn to stop doing that. And your life can be miserable. <laughs> So after that studio ended, uh, I took a long hard look at my life and myself and asked, is this really who I am? Because it's not who I thought I was, but clearly my outsides didn't match my reality, didn't match who I was inside or who I thought I was. So I started looking at, at my life and I realized it came from like my, uh, my family has a habit of doing that. You know, not, never in a malicious way. Like, we just want people to be their best. And especially my granddad. He was like a school principal, superintendent of schools, and teacher for his whole career. And a uh, very successful person. And somebody I, I highly looked up to. But I always felt like I could never live up to his standards. And um, I thought it was something... Uh, that I was doing that something that I deserved but it wasn't um, it was just him loving in the wrong direction I like this guy's pouty lip the sketch was funny because I had drawn most of it and it just didn't look like him it didn't look quite right and then I went in and just added this little tiny pouty lip. And I was like, there it is. I got it. <laughs> I love it when a sketch falls together like that. It's like that final piece clicks into place. And it's like, ah, I got it. I captured him. Yes. So relating this whole theme of, of criticism back to art. The amount of time you spend criticizing other people is the time you should be spending on your own work, improving your own work. And it really is. It's almost like an addiction criticism can be. I wasn't always like that, of course. Uh, I mean, there was, for most of my life before that, um, I'd say up until maybe my mid-20s, I was pretty like easy going and um, I just saw the best in people and I refused to criticize at all. And then um, stuff happens. You get screwed over by people, you get your heart broken, you get, you know, just failure in general. It kind of makes you feel a little bit bitter inside and uh, it adds, it, like sort of builds on itself until you lose your youthful enthusiasm. You lose your innocence. Even though it should not be like that. <laughs> the youthful enthusiasm is what keeps you going. It's what makes it worth doing all this stuff. And if you lose that, that's when you become bitter inside. and you, um, Everything you do loses its meaning. But that kind of happens, like you um, you get your heart broken and you tend to go in the opposite direction and you break somebody's heart just to understand it. And it's never intentional, like it just happens that way. You, you are trying to avoid the pain that you experienced in your previous relationship or your previous situation. And so you go out, you... you uh, you become very defensive of it and you don't want to get hurt again that way the same way and so you go in the opposite direction but you end up making the same mistake of the person that hurt you to begin with and um, that keeps going and if you're lucky you realize it you catch it before you go too far gone but then you meet people like Mr. Melancholy here who looks like he hasn't had fun day in his whole life he's just got a lot of sadness and all he's got is his melons poor little guy
life shouldn't be that hard, you know? We tend to make it that way. Just by trying to protect ourselves from getting hurt. So yeah. That's my whole thoughts on judgment, being hypercritical. So leave your judgmental comments in the <laughs> in the comment section of this video. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that pops. I like it when you add the eyes and and suddenly it pops out I like that. So yeah, I had a great time talking with Psycho. If you haven't checked out his channel, you need to. YouTube.com slash Psycho. Uh, he is a, an amazing artist and he's a great teacher himself. He's got any kind of lesson you need on drawing a figure, constructing the figure, perspective, lighting, shading, painting. He is amazing. He's very gifted at what he does. And I'm thankful that I got the opportunity to chat with him and hopefully I can chat with him again, you know, before too long. Um, I like when you get to meet people and they're actually better than you expected them to be. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, so what do I talk about for the rest of this video? <laughs> um, I guess I could talk about the drawing. How about that? So uh, this type, the Prismacolor markers that I use are an older brand or older model. Uh, and they've got these chisel tips instead of the uh, rounded brush tips. So the way that I color might be different from the technique you'll need to use for the newer ones. The newer ones are closer to like a Copic brush tip. Um, Got to add in the wrinkles in the elbow. So when I color in something, for example, I'll go back over this melon again. So the melon is a rounded object so I use the tip to to the chisel tip to go around the bottom part of it like this and it gives me a hard edge at the bottom of the marker so like this. So this part is a hard edge and the top part is a soft edge like this. Whoop. And then when you come back around the top, the top becomes your hard edge, and the bottom is a soft one. And I'm just lifting the marker a little bit off the page in order to get that effect. So it's got that rounded, you know, it creates a three-dimensional object like that, and you can put the shadows underneath and whatnot. But then on, on these melons, there's also these, uh, I sketched in these creases so I'm gonna come in with a hard edge and then I whip the pen and that gives it a soft edge as it comes back up like that and I go go back over it just to blend that a little bit better there's lots of different ways to use the marker uh, I know it, sometimes I'll do this too where I'll just coat the entire thing I'll just like let the marker slowly bleed in and you want it to bleed in you don't want it to just be streaks so if you go too fast it causes streaks but when you let it when you go slowly the alcohol on the marker bleeds out to get rid of those streaks in it so I use one I'll go in first with the, sometimes I'll go in first and just coat the entire thing so it's got that base tone. But other times I'll go in and I'll do the shading first so that when I do the, the, the uh, consistent tone across it, 
the base tone pops out. There's a lot of different ways to use markers. There's no right way. Uh, sometimes I'll ink the whole thing first. Uh, it depends on how messy the sketch is to begin with. In this case, it was pretty well thought out because uh, <laughs> this guy just sat there and he was my favorite. I had, I, yeah. So I do these bold, uh, bold strokes with the pen and I tend to pull them towards me. Now, this is different, like you saw in my, uh, I have a video that's five tips for better line drawing. This is the technique I talk about, is I, I turn the page and I pull the line towards me to get that technique. But that's not the only way to do it, I just want you to be aware. Usually when I sketch with a pencil, um, I draw from the shoulder and I stay loose and I scribble. So my point isn't to use the, the wrist in one particular direction. I keep it loose and gestural so the pen's const pencil's constantly moving. But with a pen, I want to get a nice clean stroke and so I'll go in one direction. But uh, some people are, have better control going in other directions. You know, just it depends on, on you and what you do and your strengths and whatnot. This is just kind of how I developed that's why I'm reluctant to do videos talking about how, uh, you know, how do you draw a person or how do you, you know, ink a page or, or something like that. Uh, I'll probably do more of them, but I don't want people to draw like me. I want them to draw like them. I want you to find your own voice, your own style, and the style comes from. Uh, it really comes from uh, doing it wrong, <laughs> like. I've heard, I heard one teacher put it this way, style's what you get when you can't do it right. And uh, when I first heard that, it made me angry. I was like, you're a jerk. Uh, but I kind of I kind of believe that now. Uh, and it's not necessarily that I'm doing it wrong. It's that I choose to not do it the right way. So, uh, and that, that comes from, you have to learn how to, um, how to do things the right way. You have to learn how, to, how a figure actually works. You have to learn how the skull works and how the, the facial muscles work and you have to learn all these important things to draw it really realistically. And then you throw those rules out the window and you break them. Uh, but you can't break the rules until you know them. Because up to that point you're just, you're just ha you know, making mistakes as you go and not really having any control over the situation. So, uh, yeah. So if you want to find your own style, which is a question I get from people a lot, that's basically it. You need to learn how to do it right and then figure out which rules you like and throw the, throw the ones you don't out the window. Because in the end, there's really no right way to do it. Unless you want to do be like Michelangelo or Donatello or Leonardo. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If you want to be a classically trained artist, there's a right way to do it. Um, the I've mentioned a couple times the school I went to in California, which was the Jeff Watts Atelier, and they teach the way they taught in the Renaissance, which is you've got one master that teaches everybody in the school, and it's taught. Uh, very rigorously how to draw the figure and um, understanding anatomy, understanding painting, understanding everything and um, doing it very well. Like you, you go to that, you go to school like that to get good. You don't go for a degree. You just keep going until you get it, you know, you get really, really, really good. There's no finish line. And in the Renaissance, the way they taught, they used to believe that you couldn't be a master illustrator until you, um, you'd you been taking classes for 20 years. You've been learning from a master for 20 years, which is different than the way we look at things now. 
now we're like, well, how do I, you know, I want to be amazing now. I want to get really good now. Show me which book. Show me the video. And I want to get, you know, and I'll, and I'll buy that book and that's how good I'll get. I'll get it right away. Um, but it doesn't work like that. That's not reality. Reality is lots and lots of work, lots and lots of mistakes, lots of trying, lots of failing, lots of little baby steps, little successes to get to where you want to go. My cat just ran away. So, how long is this video? I don't know. Looks like it's 20 minutes or an hour maybe. Speaking of my old school, Jeff Watts, uh, you probably have seen Proko, his channel. Proko's got some great stuff, and he actually teaches at the Jeff Watts Atelier. That's where he developed his skills. In fact, I think he started about the same time I did when I went there, which makes me think I should have, I should have stuck around. Uh, but there were reasons I had to leave. Uh, but Jeff is actually opening his own. Um, online instruction so you should check that out um, I'll put the link in the description box uh, I think he's I think it's definitely a, a something worth looking into I know I only went there for eight months it was, it was about two semesters and I learned more in those two, two semesters than I did in three years at college and four years of being self-taught uh, it was definitely worth the experience and the money, and it was actually uh, less expensive than community college. I paid cash for it. Where I'm still paying off student loans for my my uh, university degree, and I didn't even finish the degree, and I got so much more out of the Jeff Watts School. And Jeff's school isn't the only one out there. There's a lot of great schools. That's just the one that I went to. You guys live in a golden age for learning art. You should be very excited and thankful for all the opportunities that you have right now. You can take online classes from people that have been, that you, you, could, you would have had to move halfway across the world in order to meet. And now you get to just meet up with them once a week online or, or whatnot. I gotta step, stop saying whatnot. Punch me in the face. So, this guy's looking fancy. Alright. I'm going to add a little white and then I'm not going to... I'll probably finish it up a little on my, uh, on my own. I just don't want this video to go too long. So to sum up... <laughs> uh, my apologies to Chris Hart. Not that he, he needs it. More than anything, I want to apologize to you guys. Uh, it is not okay. I don't want you to think it's okay for me to criticize people. And I actually, I'll tell you a story about it. Just show you why it's important. Um, like, the thing with criticizing people is that you... Not only are you making it okay for somebody else to criticize that person, but if you do it enough times, people start to wonder, what's he saying about my saying about me behind my back? And they start mistrusting you and being cautious about what they say around you because they don't want to um, they don't want you to talk bad about them. But more importantly, uh, I've found that um, if you have an intention to um, to help people, to be a teacher or to be a mentor or to be somebody that people respect in general, uh, you can't. You have to be very careful about the words you use because uh, you curse somebody if you talk badly about them. Um, you give other people permission to judge that person before they've even met them. And so you've cursed that person's life before they, before they even have a chance to establish their own reputation with them. And 
that's bad, especially if, if you're somebody that is respected. Like, uh, my intention is to be somebody that people r respect and look to for guidance and instruction. And uh, I have a, an obligation to maintain that respect. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of it. Um, one of my one of my best friends, she is like so she's like super sweet and like one of the nicest people. And uh, she never ever gets mad at anybody. Like, and she's always been like that ever since I met her. And uh, in fact, I learned how to uh, how to be kind again because of her. How to get my youthful enthusiasm back and my um, my joy, really, just from this friendship. And but I remember after at one point she started working as a uh, like a shift supervisor at a coffee shop, and um, one day she was telling me about this employee that she had that she couldn't stand and this person was just uh she was always starting fights with people even with employees and or even with customers and she was always just smelly and angry and uh just a very unlikable person so unlikable that even my friend didn't like her and uh the more that she t this was like over a course of a few weeks. The more she told me about this person, the worse the situation seemed to get. And it it finally occurred to me that like, are you saying any of this stuff to the people you work with? Like, you know, your friend. I know you guys are friends and stuff. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, they bring it up, and and um, she's just a very frustrating person, and she's just such an angry person. You know, it's hard to like her. And I said, yeah, but are you saying anything about this? And she's like, well, yeah. And I said, see, the thing is, you're not an average person. You are, like, the nicest person. And if you don't like this woman, what is that saying to everybody else in the world? If the nicest person in the world hates this woman, how this, she must be the worst person in the world. And uh, so the situation, that's why it was getting worse. And I said, what you need to do is bring love to the situation. And that's the phrase I use to remind myself. It's love, not judge. And so she started going into work and being excessively nice to this woman uh, and trying to find opportunities to um, help this woman do more. And uh, she started having her do, she found out that this woman was an artist and she started having her do like chalk artwork on uh, drawing advertisements for the coffee shop on the sidewalk outside. And uh, so this girl would even come in, this woman would even come in on her off time to do that. And she started becoming happier and nicer. And uh, over the course of two weeks, her attitude like completely changed. And the attitude of everybody that worked there completely changed. And this woman came in and told my friend, I need to leave. I'm quitting. And she's like, why? And she says, because I need to go check myself into rehab. Uh, I've been, you know... I've had a drinking problem for a long time and an anger problem and uh, I haven't had anybody be kind to me in a long time until you. And she left. She like moved to Vegas and got into rehab and um, was completely out of my friend's hair. And that happens sometimes when you, when you judge and criticize, not only does it give other people to judge and criticize and uh, pile on to somebody that seems like they are fully deserving of criticism, but maybe they're deserving of it because they don't feel like they deserve love. They deserve to be judged and, and hated. And uh, and I know I've been that person. I don't know why I ever thought it was okay to judge people because I've been in situations where I felt like there's nothing I can do right. I was just always in trouble. And so there's no point in trying to be nice. There's no point in giving back and contributing. And so my behavior was making things worse. And so was the behavior of everyone around me. And uh, so I've been that person. And I've been the one that caused the situation. And so what it comes down to is love, not judge. <laughs> right, Mr. Mellon?
Yeah. Anyways, uh, I'm going to end the video here. And I promise more upbeat videos from now on. I just wanted to get this out of the way. I've actually tried making this video like three times. That's why it's up like a week late. But um, thank you guys for watching. And I hope you got something out of this. And um, keep smiling.